in this practical what we are trying to do is we are trying to see the effect of a plant extract on bacterial growth so what we are doing in summary is we are going to provide the best possible conditions for the bacteria to grow we are going to provide them with plenty of food going to provide them with a safe environment with no competition from any other organisms um, we are going to maintain these sterile conditions throughout um, and we are going to then challenge them to grow in the presence of the plant extract we are going to provide the best uh, temperature the best pH the oxygen requirement for the bacteria and then we are going to allow them to grow we, we are going to see whether they can grow with the plant extract or whether they cannot and to what extent they are able to grow so what we do is in the first one uh, in the first step we, we are going to prepare food for the bacteria we are literally going to cook a meal for the bacteria a meal that the bacteria would like and that it could grow well in um, we are going to sterilize the equipment as well as the nutrients so that only the bacteria that we desire to grow will be allowed to grow in the others just cannot find a way in um, we are then going to serve the bacteria its food by pouring it out into a sterile petri dish that's the third segment in this uh, uh, presentation uh, and then finally we are going to invite our guests in the bacteria the pure culture just the type of bacteria that we so desire to grow uh, in this are going to be allowed to enter uh, and they are going to be uh, provided with the food that we prepared for them uh, and the process by which we put the bacteria into uh, the food into the nutrient medium is called inoculation then we prepare a plant extract which should have an antibacterial agent uh, and then we are going to challenge the bacteria to grow in this we are going to provide the best conditions for the bacteria to grow the best pH uh, a most suitable pH for the bacteria uh, we are going to provide an optimum temperature uh, oxygen the way the bacteria prefers it uh, and we are going th that's called incubation and we're going to see whether the bacteria can grow in the presence of this plant extract and finally in section 7 uh, we'll be checking how we could measure uh, bacterial growth what are the ways by which uh, the bacterial growth could be measured uh, so that we can then assess the effect of the antibiotic on its growth or the inhibitory effect of the antibiotic as the first step for this procedure uh, as I said in the previous section we are going to cook food for the bacteria we, we are literally going to prepare a meal for the bacteria uh, now when we when we do this there are certain considerations to make uh, we, we should make sure that the food is in the form that the bacteria can really use uh, one of the very commonly used uh, nutrient mediums is uh, something called uh, beef extract uh, nutrient agar. It's it's uh, an extract from beef, uh, and it's got agar mixed with it, so that uh, it will easily solidify when cooled. So so what we do is we first of all, uh, when we you can buy this literally, you can buy this from any of the suppliers who supply chemicals, and on the label there'll be for for every extract there'll be instructions, and the instructions would go something like this, saying uh, dissolve. 180 grams of powder in 500 ml of uh, distilled water so then what we'll do is we'll um, first of all fill into a beaker 500 ml of distilled water then we accurately weigh 180 grams of this powder and then we will put that into this and into the beaker and slowly dissolve that as we warm this the solubility will uh, improve and uh, you could actually with a glass rod stir it so that the nutrients are uniformly uh, dispersed and they dissolve easily uh, now once we do this once we've uh, dissolved all the powder into the liquid uh, we now have um, a molten nutrient agas and, and then we fill that into uh, a bottle uh, for convenience of autoclaving and we then put the cap on very lightly uh, because while the autoclave um, there must be some um, air should be allowed to move out otherwise expansion may cause the bottles to crack uh, so we don't really cap these covers very tightly we just keep it uh, loosely attached so that's what we'll do in this and 
what what would this nutrient medium contain the nutrient medium will usually contain some uh, nutrients like glucose there would be amino acids there would be some lipids in those all of which the bacteria can utilize for its growth you have some vitamins some mineral ions uh, now, now these are some of the common components that you would find in most nutrient media and the agar in the medium does not provide any nutrients the agar simply holds the nutrients and the agar will solidify and provide provide a nice smooth surface for the bacteria to grow on um, and that's why we add agar into this now the agar when it's molten uh, when it's at 55 degrees celsius uh, it's easy to handle and uh, it's still molten it's not solidified and agar will solidify at about 45 degrees celsius so what we do is when we prepare this nutrient agar uh, and we autoclave it after autoclaving we should cool this down to about 55 degrees celsius so that it's still uh, cool enough for us to handle uh, but it doesn't solidify so 55 is a handling good handling temperature and then after that we cool and we allow the agar to solidify so so basically what we've got here is we've provided we are providing the bacteria uh, with all the essential nutrients for growth and we are providing a surface on which the bacteria can grow uh, and absorb nutrients from the agar uh, medium because the agar will hold all these nutrients and allow the bacteria to slowly absorb these the second step of this uh, procedure is sterilizing of nutrient medium and the other equipment um, now when we mean sterilizing we mean uh, we want to make all the equipment as well as the nutrient media germ free bacteria free uh, virus free fungi free so that uh, there's no other microorganisms in the medium or on the equipment uh, that could contaminate the nutrient medium uh, and compete with the bacteria that we are trying to grow in the petri dish uh, remember here we, we usually try to grow uh, bacteria of just one type in the petri dish uh, so that we can check the antibacterial effect uh, of the plant extract on that particular bacteria uh, so what we do is uh, we uh, need to keep this uh, free of contamination the nutrient should be free of contamination and uh, as a prerequisite we have to sterilize everything uh, except the inoculum everything else should be uh, sterile over here and one of the ways of sterilizing uh, equipment is by a process called uh, in fact by using an equipment called an autoclave we sterilize equipment now what I've drawn here is I've drawn a very simple plan of what an autoclave would look like um, at the bottom over here we we usually fill the autoclave in the, the tray at the bottom with some water and on the shelf one of the shelves we place the nutrient agar bottles which we had prepared and filled earlier um, we stack up petri dishes wrapped in aluminium foil the aluminium foil will prevent contamination once we remove the petri dishes after sterilizing them uh, so that we can then keep them in the lab and use them as in how we and when we need um, we have a tray here with all the other equipment um, like pipettes uh, spreaders whatever we need to use for this uh, equipment we can sterilize it whatever has to be sterilized is kept in this tray and then we seal the autoclave uh, usually when the autoclave is sealed now what you can see is the cover of the autoclave and there's a safety valve here because it's a very high pressure chamber um, usually the pressure inside would be one zero three kilopascals and at this pressure uh, water will boil at 121 degrees celsius 
and we should maintain this temperature of 121 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes. It's basically a pressure cooker. Um, now why 121 degrees Celsius and why 15 minutes? Uh, what happens is if you simply boil the water or, or if you boil the equipment, uh, it kills all the bacteria all right, uh, but the bacterial spores are very heat resistant. They don't easily get destroyed with uh, by boiling at 100 degrees Celsius. So by experimentation what scientists have found is that if you heat the spores to 121 degrees Celsius and maintain that temperature for 15 minutes then it kills all the bacteria in the medium as well as the heat resistant spores. So now you have a medium uh, that is completely free of bacteria uh, because if the spores remain what will happen is when the conditions are suitable for growth uh, the spores will again grow into bacteria. They will become active and they will grow into bacteria again. So we must make sure that everything is free of active bacteria as well as spores which are basically uh, bacteria in an inactive form with a heat resistant wall around it. Uh, so basically that's what we do in, in this uh, autoclaving uh, and it's one of the aseptic techniques. Remember uh, all along you will be coming across a word called aseptic which literally means uh, maintaining sterile conditions uh, to prevent the growth of bacteria uh, and, and basically uh, autoclaving is one of the ways by which uh, we can ensure that bacteria are not in the medium uh, or in the petri dishes or in any of the equipment that we are going to use for this procedure. In section 1 we had prepared food for the bacteria and then in section 2 uh, we sterilize the food so that there's no competition for the bacteria that we are trying to grow in here. Uh, in this uh, third section, we are going to serve the food for the bacteria. The food which we had prepared in step one and sterilized in step two, we are now going to serve it out for the bacteria to eat. Uh, so what we'll do is, uh, we'll uh, first of all use one of the petri dishes. Uh, these petri dishes had been sterilized earlier by autoclaving if you remember uh, we autoclave them we put them into um, an aluminium foil and this is an autoclave petri dish so it's germ free now we place this on a tabletop and that tabletop could have bacteria on it so what we do is we wipe the table with 70% ethanol or bleach which we call as sodium hypochlorite and both of these uh, either of these will uh, kill any bacteria on the surface uh, so that there's less risk of contamination now this nutrient agar uh, is in a bottle and it's autoclave. Now as soon as we open the bottle cap uh, there could be a draft of air that could carry bacteria into the nutrient air bath. So the airborne bacteria could get in. So what we do is to prevent this from happening uh, we keep the bottle near a flame of the Bunsen burner and as soon as we open, as soon as we uncap the bottle we heat the mouth of the bottle so that the air in this region will expand and when the air expands there will be a hot air draft and the air will move outwards so that there is uh, little chance of bacteria from the air falling into the medium and, and this prevents airborne contamination. So we flame the neck of the bottle or the mouth of the bottle and then quickly open the, the lid you can see we, we open it as little as possible and quickly pour in a swift one single action we pour the agar uh, into this petri dish and we don't fill it completely uh, we fill it um, just a little more than half and we quickly replace the lid we remove the bottle and we replace the lid and then we allow 
they got the full and solidify now the food of the bacteria has been served uh, the next step would be to invite the bacteria in the bacteria that we have invited without any uninvited guests uh, so uh, that's what we need to do in this procedure and uh, these techniques here like opening the lid of the petri dish as little as possible is an aseptic technique um, heating the neck of the bottle is another aseptic technique uh, sterilizing the uh, surface of the bench or the tabletop on which you are working is another aseptic technique and, and all this helps to keep the um, nutrients free of contamination in section 4 we are we're looking at inoculation now what what do you mean by inoculation inoculation means introducing the bacteria uh, uh, usually it's a pure culture uh, a pure culture is a culture that um, has only one type of bacteria on it uh, so it doesn't have many different types of bacteria it's just got one species um, and that's what we call as a pure culture and this bacteria uh, these this bacteria species is now called the inoculum because we are going to inoculate the medium with this bacteria which means we are going to introduce uh, these bacteria into the medium into the nutrient medium uh, like I usually tell you um, these are the bacteria that we are inviting in for the dinner that we prepared for them uh, and we don't want any uninvited guests we don't want this uh, nutrient medium to be contaminated we just want the bacteria that we are introducing into this petri dish to grow in there and no other bacteria uh, so what we do is again um, this inoculum uh, you could buy the inoculum uh, they usually sell pure cultures of bacteria uh, or you could prepare one yourself by a technical subculture which is uh, beyond the scope of this so I won't uh, go into that too much um, so what we do is just like uh, when you open the nutrient agar bottle there could be a draft of air which would enter and along with that bacteria from the atmosphere may enter into uh, this medium into the inoculum and, and contaminate your culture uh, so what we do is as soon as we open the neck uh, the cap of the bottle we don't place the cap on the table top or anywhere but you hold it in your little finger uh, between the little finger and the palm uh, obviously your hand should be sterilized by washing uh, with a mild antiseptic uh, and then you flame the neck of the bottle again you're flaming the neck so that the the air at the neck expands and there's going to be a hot air draft so airborne contamination of bacteria of the inoculum will be prevented now as soon as we finish that what we'll do is we'll use a sterile pipette so you use a sterile pipette uh, which has been uh, autoclaved so that it's germ free and you transfer you quickly transfer some of this inoculum into the sterile pit, uh, nutrient agar right on the middle of it uh, you transfer about um, 5 sorry 0 0.5 centimeter cube onto the surface and you quickly uh, replace the lid now don't open the petri dish completely don't completely remove the dish open it as little as possible just like when you were pouring the nutrient agar in and once you're done quickly uh, replace the lid and put the sterile pipette into a beaker containing ethanol so that's again another aseptic uh, technique which you need to follow now once we've done this now we have to spread the bacteria onto the agar surface and for that we use a plastic spreader and this will give us a nice uh, even spread of bacteria on the agar surface uh, we'll get something called a lawn culture uh, l a w n a lawn culture 
uh, which would be like the grass on the lawn growing nice and even so that you have bacteria evenly spread out so that you'll have colonies uh, uniformly distributed on the plate. Now before using the plastic spreader what we'll need to do is we'll need to dip this plastic spreader into ethanol and then flame it. Now when you flame it uh, this will actually catch fire. Keep it away from the beaker of ethanol and once this catches fire allow the ethanol to really burn off so the ethanol will be burning off uh, the plastic spreader will not get damaged because uh, ethanol burns at a very low um, temperature so there's no no danger of uh, actually making the plastic spreader catch fire and once the ethanol burns away the, the spreader is now sterile and what you can now do is you can use this to spread the inoculum onto the surface just like uh, spreading butter onto your bread you have a nice even um, spread of the bacteria onto uh, the agar surface it's been long known that uh, plants usually uh, contain antibacterial substances uh, and uh, what we are trying to do in this experiment is we are, we are as I told you earlier we are preparing um, nutrients for the bacteria we are providing them with the best conditions for growth and then we are trying to see whether the plant extract can stop them from growing uh, and usually many plants uh, in the extracts they contain some antibacterial substances uh, and these are usually trapped within the cells uh, so what we try to do is we try to remove uh, these chemicals from the cells and then um, subject the bacteria to these chemicals. We expose the bacteria to these chemicals and see whether the chemicals can prevent the growth of bacteria. Uh, now what we need to do is first of all we should weigh a specific mass of plant tissue uh, so that the conditions will then be uh, standardized for all the trials whether you're trying uh, say garlic and mint if you want to compare um, you need to use the same mass of garlic and mint uh, for each of the trials so that then you can make a valid comparison otherwise the comparison wouldn't be valid say for example if you take 100 grams of garlic and crush them and make an extract of that with a little ethanol or water and you take just one gram of mint obviously the mint is going to have less of the uh, antibacterial agent coming out of the cells into the ethanol or into the distilled water so the extract will be less concentrated with the chemical with the antibacterial agent and then you wouldn't be able to compare the antibacterial effect in a reliable and valid manner. Uh, so that's why we need to use uh, the same mass. The same mass of plant tissue must be used um, and we usually peel or remove all the unnecessary um, parts of the plant tissue for example garlic we remove the dry skin we just use the pulpy uh, part where we think most of the antibiotic uh, or the antibacterial substance may be present uh, so we peel the tissue uh, if it's mint we remove all the woody parts or the hard stalks and we just take the leaves which are easy to crush and easy to blend uh, so that again we get maximum uh, a chemical coming into the extract so we we try to clean the tissue uh, removing all the unnecessary unwanted parts uh, and we then weigh a specific mass of it and the next thing is to draw this tissue out of the cell uh, draw the, uh, the antibacterial chemical out of the plant cells uh, we need to dissolve it so we either use ethanol or distilled water uh, now ethanol is um, by itself an antibacterial agent uh, so uh, using ethanol as um, a solvent over here uh, may have some uh, implications while uh, analyzing the results but but using ethanol really has an advantage because uh, ethanol uh, will dissolve the cell membranes what what ethanol does is you know if you have a plant cell and you have the antibacterial agent inside there let's say these are the antibacterial agents uh, when you use ethanol ethanol will literally uh, break open the cell membranes it will dissolve away the cell membranes so that the antibacterial chemical the agent is now 
free and it can easily come into uh, the plant extract into the filtrate so ethanol really opens up the cells uh, so that these antibacterial substances can be removed from the cells and you and, and that's why some people think it's more effective um, but again uh, you need to use the same volume of ethanol every time you try uh, you make an extract again so that you could make valid comparisons otherwise you wouldn't be able to compare the two um, we sometimes use distilled water uh, again how would the chemical come out of the cells in that case uh, that's why you blend when you blend this in a food blender uh, again you see the blending time is something which should be uh, kept constant it's a variable that needs to be controlled uh, for all the types of plant extracts and all the trials um, and blending will actually open up the cells it will break open some of the cells and release some of these uh, antibacterial substances from the cells and that's why we blend and once we blend we get a pulp uh, and then we filter the pulp using a filter paper funnel uh, we uh, filter the pulp and when we filter we get a residue which we'll have to discard in this case and the filtrate the filtrate is the liquid which uh, passes through the filter paper uh, and that is the one where the antibacterial agent will be present the, and the chemical that's going to kill the bacteria or stop its growth uh, will be present in that filtrate then what we do is we we take a filter paper a single filter paper and we use a punch and we punch some filter paper discs out of this filter paper and we take some of these discs these small discs are taken and they are soaked in the extract so that when we use all the discs from the same filter paper uh, they are all going to have the same thickness and we soak them for the same duration of time again so that they all take up the same uh, amount of e uh, uh, same amount of extract uh, or they have uh, the same time to absorb the extract and then that makes a more valid comparison and these filter paper discs before soaking them we could actually sterilize them again we could place them in the autoclave um, and make sure that they also receive the same temperature treatment so that they are completely uh, sterile before they are used now once we uh, have soaked the filter paper discs in um, the filtrate in the plant extract uh, now we have to transfer them onto uh, the nutrient media which has already uh, been inoculated uh, so what we do is we first of all um, heat uh, the tip of a forcep um, into uh, in a Bunsen burner flame and then what we need to do is we need to heat this till it's red hot and once this uh, that, that's again to sterilize it to kill any bacteria that may be on its surface to prevent contamination of the nutrient medium we then allow it to cool a little uh, and then we transfer we quickly transfer some of the soaked filter paper disc so this is a filter paper disc which is soaked in the plant extract and we do this for different types of plant extracts um, the same procedure is repeated and we can have different type of plant extracts um, and we put in each each of these filter paper discs will have a different type of uh, extract let's say uh, one of this may be soaked in distilled water um, that's assuming that all of these um, extracts have been prepared by making distilled water alone uh, but if we are preparing the extract by using ethanol then all um, then we should then we should use ethanol and that will be the control now different discs would have been soaked in different extracts maybe this is let's say mint a mint extract this may be a garlic extract this may be 
and extract from onion and this may be an extract from cardamom so one of the spices um, and, and this is what uh, we are doing in this experiment so we use different type of extracts you may uh, in some experiments they may soak the filter paper discs in different concentrations of the extract um, they may uh, in some cases uh, use just two filter paper discs one with where the extract has been made with water the other where the extract has been uh, made using ethanol and compare to see which is uh, a better solvent for the extraction of these antibacterial agents so, so there could be so many variations now ultimately once you place these discs into uh, the petri dish you need to seal the petri dish but uh, when I say seal the petri dish please be very careful uh, you shouldn't apply uh, cello tape all around the petri dish uh, just two strips of cello tape as shown here uh, is what is required and the only reason for adding the cello tape is to ensure that the cover doesn't separate from the dish uh, that's the only reason uh, oxygen should be allowed oxygen will enter through uh, the cover of the petri dish from the gap between the dish and the cover oxygen will diffuse in and the bacteria that you are growing here will need oxygen they are aerobic bacteria uh, if you seal the dish completely with cello tape all around uh, then anaerobic conditions will prevail and these anaerobic conditions will give rise to anaerobic bacteria uh, which is something we don't want this is something which is undesirable so we don't want this happening inside our petri dishes we don't want the anaerobic bacteria to grow in there and then we incubate these dishes now we incubate them uh, at the optimum temperature uh, which is for non-pathogenic bacteria 25 degrees Celsius uh, 37 degrees Celsius is something we should never use why because pathogenic bacteria will grow well at 37 degrees Celsius but they won't grow well at 25 and we don't want to culture pathogenic bacteria in our lab uh, as a safety precaution uh, you are not allowed to incubate bacteria at 37 degrees Celsius uh, also you are not allowed to grow anaerobic bacteria so you are only going to, going to grow aerobic bacteria um, again because many of the anaerobic bacteria are pathogenic uh, and obviously in your culture medium uh, there will be an agent a buffer which maintains an optimum pH for for the bacteria that you're trying to grow and we provide all these conditions and in about 36 hours your plate is going to look like this uh, where you have you can see the gray area is areas where bacteria have grown and these areas where it's still the the it's prevented the growth of bacteria uh, those are regions where it's clear and uh, we will use these clear zones to measure the antibacterial effect in the last section we have to measure the antibacterial effect of the plant uh, extract and uh, what we do is for this um, we use the diameter of this clear zone so you see we assume that this is more or less a circle and we measure the diameter in four different directions the width of this clear zone you can see there's a clear zone there so we measure the diameter and then we take the average um, just to make the results uh, as accurate as we can uh, we, we do this and then um, the area of the clear zone the area of the clear zone 
equals pi r square that's half of the average diameter uh, and that is proportionate to the antibacterial effect So uh, that's how we measure. So if we look at this, um, this disc has the least antibacterial effect. And this one obviously since the area of the clear zone is the largest, it has the greatest antibacterial effect uh, and and based on that we can now we found a way to quantify uh, the effect of the plant extract on the growth of bacteria uh, it's because when the when the plant extract diffuses into the medium um, in these regions even though the nutrients are available uh, you have see in these in these regions you have nutrients you have an optimum pH so these are proper uh, you have the optimum oxygen levels the temperature is suitable then why haven't the bacteria grown uh, the only reason is because the plant uh, extract has something in it uh, that is not allowing the bacteria to grow there and and that's the reason why that area is clear and there's no bacteria growing in those regions mm -hmm. like in the other regions where there's no plant extract. Uh, so by looking at the diameter of the clear zone it's it's one of the ways of assessing uh, the effectiveness of the antibiotic. Uh, however there's a big limitation to this method. Um, uh, usually what happens is if uh, the chemical nature itself of the antibiotic uh, say for example it's a very light antibiotic uh, it will usually diffuse faster and, and reach uh, further away from the disc thereby uh, giving us an illusion that you know the antibacterial effect is more uh, whereas uh, another one which is a very heavy antibiotic chemically very large uh, might diffuse very slowly maybe maybe like this one here and uh, that will have uh, appear to have a slower antibacterial effect now, when in effect uh, in actual um, assessment both of them are killing bacteria the the only difference is one is reaching further away the other is not reaching uh, maybe because of its chemical size but uh, but here we make an assumption that uh, all of them are diffusing at the same rate or or we allow uh, to overcome that we can allow the bacteria to grow uh, for 36 hours for 48 hours so that uh, all the chemicals get enough time to diffuse as far as they can uh, and, and that could um, overcome this limitation to some extent, but, but that limitation is always there when you use this method. Uh, if you want to really um, check the antibacterial effect, you'll have to uh, maybe look at uh, the growth of bacteria in a liquid medium uh, and do a real count of the bacteria. There are other techniques for counting bacteria, uh, and that is a more uh, reliable method of uh, actually assessing the antibacterial effect. But but for school experiments this one works really fine so uh, and I think this is what is uh, going to be examined as far as I can see uh, so uh, all the best for your exams uh, once again uh, wish you all the best uh, and hope this helps uh, look out for a few more videos I'll be posting some more